Good evening and welcome to this event, a very happy moment for the Fever family, which is a big family that keeps growing. My name is uh, Mariana Casano Cano, I am climate communication expert and I collaborate with uh, the program for energy efficiency in buildings, well known as the FIP, that was created in 2016 at COP20 in Marrakesh, following the initiative of France and Germany. And it is my pleasure today to be your moderator for the event entitled Boosting Green Buildings to Tackle the Energy and Climate Crisis. And we have a very amazing panel of speakers today uh, who made the time in this first busy day at COP27. We have Madame Sarah Badoui, who is Global Ambassador with the UNFCCC High Level Champion and founder of. From here, Egypt. So, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. We have Monsieur Rebillou, the director of the director of the French Agency for the Development, La Langue Française du Développement. We also have Infant Javier Lahoven. Infant is um, a member of the management board at the GSF, the German Development Agency. To my right, Dr. Dalan Vidiana. Dr. Dalan Kujian, Director General of the Directorate General of Renewable Energy and Energy Conservation at the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Resources of Indonesia. We have Madame Theodora Obradovi. Madame Theodora Obradovi is the State Councillor on Climate Change at the Ministry of the Environment and Physical Planning of the Republic of Macedonia because Macedonia and Indonesia are two of the countries that will benefit from this program. We also have in the audience uh, Madame Vera Rodenhoff who will give some closing remarks. And today, as I said, it is a very, very happy day because we are introducing here a new initiative that got a very important backing a few days ago from the Green Planet Fund. Thank you to that. There will be initiatives to reduce energy use and build resilience in buildings in 11 countries with hot climate in various regions of the world. And without further delay, I will give the floor to Madame Sara Alba for an initial keynote on the situation of buildings and the climate. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I think this is an exciting breakthrough. And um, I established a company that specializes in green buildings in Egypt. It's the first registered green building company in Egypt. This was back in 2010. And it took me two years to register the nature of the practice because it's not conventional engineering and it's not environmental strategy or that kind of company. Um, and the questioning behind establishing eConsult was, why are there so few buildings when there's such a huge market and the construction sector is the fastest growing in the MENA region? Why are there so few green buildings? What's the barrier? Is it the money? We all know it's not the money because we're building skyscrapers and the tallest and the you know most fascinating. It's not the money. It's is it the fact that it's not celebrated enough? Is that what we want? So we started questioning why are there so few green buildings? But the point that we were trying to make is, is that we need a redefinition of what makes a building smart and what makes a building beautiful. And if it's not making people inside comfortable, then it's not smart. And if it's not reflecting where it is and responding to the contextual needs of the very people that we use it after we leave, then is it beautiful or is it imposing? So all of these questions bring us back to localizing the green building model. In Egypt, we are um, facing extreme polar heat stress. We are reaching 45 degrees during the day, and in the evening, sometimes in winter, we reach zero. 
and our buildings are not designed to be that flexible. And we rely entirely on air conditioning. And the household income in Egypt, 30% of it is spent on cooling. That's a significant amount. So something is not working. And the way we define in the market a green building is that we have a conventional building and we stick a couple of solar panels and we call it green. The media is calling green buildings green because they have solar panels on it. Whereas the market is moving in completely different directions. Renewable energy is an element that is critical for buildings, but buildings that encourage savings is a whole other market. So you've got heat stress, you have removal of energy subsidies, an increase in the price of energy that is costing everyone so much money, and you've got water scarcity. And you don't have enough investment in R&D to give you the options for an architect like myself to build with X, Y, or Z. And for the longest time, the investment has been very reluctant because the market has been so resistant to new buildings. Why? Because in developing economies, green buildings are seen as haute couture. They are seen as high-end. And the examples that are you know, marketed are extremely high-end for very large work budgets. And this isn't the budget or a reflection of the entire population. 58 million Egyptians live in villages. They don't hire architects. That's a market that we don't tap into. They don't want to live the way we want to live. They want to live on their agricultural land. They want to have their freedoms. They want to have climate proofing in the way that they are exposed to the climate. We, we're not in that exposed. So all of these questions really call for, you know, um, creating a market and investing in affordable, accessible, green buildings all over the hot climate countries. This is where we work. So this is our market and this is our niche. We do two things as a green as a green building company. We have the largest portfolio of certified green building in Egypt and our competitors or the right competitors are giant companies that make huge powers where we produce green certified villages and farm villages. So but yet we're treated the same. The market treats us the same. You build green buildings and you build green buildings. We're trying to build life units that work, not just green buildings. And I think this is where the future conversation is going. When we leave, when we are not that important, how is a building serving the people that live in it? How is it adapting and evolving and changing and responding? And is that the new smart? And we discovered a lot of things throughout our work. We discovered that there is so much inherent indigenous knowledge because some of our villages are doing a lot better than our cities in terms of climate resilience. And we need to tap into these indigenous technologies, promote them, uh, maybe tweak them a little bit so that they are scalable. And so today we have great examples on the ground. We have the first carbon neutral project in the MENA region built for farm workers. And the price of that project, with its energy, is the same as the conventional architecture. So there are no ceilings. These misconceptions about green buildings are very expensive. We put that burden on ourselves, by the way. There are green buildings everywhere that are affordable. So I'm really happy that green buildings are getting a lot of space and the definitions of what a green building are becoming more and more sophisticated and the projects on the ground all over the world, especially in Africa, are now expressing themselves quite technically, you know, the, the, the environmental aspect, the financial, the technology is verified, it's very tech, it's verifiable, people are able to use the buildings once we leave. And I think the, I have to say this, but I think that the women-led architecture practice in green buildings is finally getting some breathing space. And I think it's really encouraging because when we go to these areas, these rural areas, 
we get to meet our customers, we get to talk to the other women, we get to enter the household, we get to talk to tribal leaders and encourage them. So I see a huge transformation. And through the work of the UNFCCC, the definition of human settlements is a wonderful way to express that that is exactly who we're trying to work for, not shiny magazines with engineering excellence. We know we can do fantastic machines, but can we make people comfortable? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sara. Making livable, uh, livable buildings for people and the planet and putting people at the center. And now I would like to turn to uh, Remy because I know also that both Sara and Remy must leave to participate in the global stock take and we really appreciate that you found the time to share with us this moment of celebration. Remy, we heard today's finance day. Where is the money? Where is the role? What is the role of financial institutions and development banks in making not green but livable buildings for the planet and for people possible? Thank you and good afternoon, all of you. Mathilde will replace me, of course. Uh, well, she knows more than I uh, on this uh, from the start in Marrakesh back in 2016 uh, uh, with others uh, about this very important um, and uh, growing nicely uh, initiative. Uh, but yes, I wanted uh, to be here to express uh, our full support and um, of course, if I was not convinced, hearing you, Sarah, uh, made, you made the case so so strongly and vividly, and we uh, we heard that this is not really about uh, building; it, it's really about uh, our societies, uh, the, the transformation that climate change is inducing for our way of. Um, of building the cities, of living, of uh, maybe to complement what you said, uh, I will remind the audience of a few uh, macro uh, figures. Uh, so we know um, we have to talk about building uh, in, at COP. Uh, maybe we're discussing a lot about energy, about agriculture, but this the, the, this is a giant issue huh, for for climate change. Forty percent of uh, uh, total emissions uh, and a lot uh, to optimize, uh, of course. And this is particularly important uh, in the developing world, which is uh, the mandate of uh, EFD, of GIZ, of uh, many colleagues in the room. Since, uh, uh, well, there's a new, there's a new Paris uh, built uh, every week uh, in uh, the developing world. So just to show the magnitude of what uh, we are talking about uh, and all we can uh, build properly now uh, will help uh, over time um, for the benefit of all of us but and also for the people that we live uh, in this uh, in these cities it's uh, so it's a uh, it's a climate it's a major climate issue to build resilient and efficient uh, building it's also a massive social uh, priority so when when we oppose development and climate, I mean, this is a this is a good case to make that uh, no, uh, it's the same issue uh, actually. It's it's about sustainable development. It's um, it's a major source of uh, job creation, two hundred and twenty million jobs already uh, in the in the sector. It's uh, of course a crucial uh, health uh, issue if we want to reduce the. The, the death toll when heat waves uh, will multiply. Um, and it's also a major education uh, issue because I, I was, I had a lunch with the French, uh, the new French education minister recently. Uh, and he said to me, well, we have, it was, I think it was in, in, in July. And he said, well, we have a, we have a problem. Uh, we will have to change the dates of the exams uh, in France because it's too hot in, uh, in the rooms. Uh, and, and, and the whole education infrastructure has to be revised, uh, and it's huge. Uh, and, and it's only one example of uh, the immense job we have uh, in, uh, in front of us. Um, this, is a, this is a major issue for public banks, uh, of course, turning to the, to the financing. Uh, of course, uh, 
private finance is flowing, uh, as you said, uh, in the direction by, by itself, in the direction of uh, uh, the construction sector. But if we want to um, um, provide the, the proper incentives, uh, if we want to do the training, if we want to de risk, uh, if we want to uh, accompany uh, municipalities in the way they think uh, urban development, well, you need a bit of uh, public resources. Uh, and our institutions uh, are there, close to, uh, to the mayors, close to uh, the governments, uh, close to civil society, uh, to try to find the best possible, uh, possible uh, way. So this movement we created uh, called Finance in Common. Uh, we gathered in Abidjan uh, two weeks ago. So the idea is to to embark all public development banks in the world, 520 uh, identified. Um, so it's not commercial bank owned by the public. It's really uh, um, public financial institutions that have a development mandate, sustainable development mandate, and um, uh, push them uh, in the right direction. The, the IDFC club, which is a, a coalition within financing common and heading, uh, is already reporting uh, 16 billion dollar investments toward energy efficiency and new buildings and industrial facilities. It's in the green finance mapping we just released uh, during COP 27. So it's it's beginning just to measure our collective capacity uh, to do more and to do better. And I close by saying that uh, of course um, the PIP Cool program. Uh, is, uh, is the perfect tool to accelerate uh, the awareness uh, and to push uh, our community to, uh, to, to action. Um, so really a huge thank to, uh, to of course, our GIZ from the, from the start and the German, and the German government. Um, we are on this uh, together. Uh, thanks to, um, to the European Commission from right, there is a new, uh, new demo for, for the PIB partnership, 30 million euro grant for PIB Med, uh, that will start uh, at the end of this year. Uh, and thanks to, to the World Climate Fund, yes. Uh, the, you can hear maybe a, a lot of criticism sometimes about the Green Climate Fund, uh, but I'm a strong advocate of uh, this uh, institution, and this is a proof of uh, how useful it is, uh, uh, giving us um, so much, 220 million euro uh, funding, to boost uh, our programs in 11 countries. Uh, and the pipeline of uh, over 1.3 billion is already identified uh, by our group. Uh, and it can only help with the technical assistance, with the concessionality for, for our loans uh, to, do, to do way more. And, and last point, the GCF is important also because uh, we will follow the, the guidelines in terms of, of uh, on environmental and social standards, including uh, gender equality because it's also a way um, uh, we, we can do it properly, building uh, uh, new cities uh, that are most more favorable, friendly uh, for gender equality. Uh, well, I'll stop here. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Lenny. Thank you. A special thanks, uh, both of you. Please, uh, you, you can uh, leave us, because I know that you are very busy, and uh, Mathilde Bordorin will, will continue with us. And we stay anyway in very good hands, because uh, now I would like to give the floor and Ingrid. We heard uh, from the AFD, and now we will hear from the GIZ, that the German cooperation, about what is it, the huge potential. We kind of uh, got a little bit of a, a bit of it, what um, Amy was saying, these 200, over 200 millions will help leverage around 1.3 billion uh, US dollar, which is not uh, nothing. Actually, it was the biggest uh, package uh, of support decided in the last uh, GCF uh, board meeting. So, so energy efficiency in buildings, it's top on the, on the agenda. Ingrid, what, what is it now that it's opening up for, for PIB? What is it, its potential? And also, what is the view of the German corporation? Yeah, thank you so, so much, Mariana, for, for having me. And and indeed, perhaps one has to put first uh, people a little bit into the broader perspective. We are really 
and we are living um, um, very difficult times. Um, here we see really um, price peaks um, in the energy sector, in the consumption sector at large. It's a time where we really have to deal with the energy and climate crisis more forcefully. But at the same time, it's about trust building because you know that really to protect the global common, we have to make sure that people, institutions, country work together. And PEEP actually is a very good example to deal with both issues. The first one is about energy efficiency. We have little programs of that scale and magnitude and importance that deal with energy efficiency in a very cross-cutting manner. Um, and now it has a chance really to be scaled up. Over five years, actually, AFD and GEZ, uh, with the support of both governments, uh, France and Germany, we piloted approaches how to bring together financial solutions that are fit for purpose at the local level with the type of technical cooperation that is needed in order to build a capacity and the regulatory frameworks that are needed in order to bring a program to scale. And additionally, um, the issue was about cooperation to bring different cultures of institutions together and make sure that we really can deploy our complementarities. The AFD as a financial bank, and GIZ as an agency that really tries to strengthen institution and capacity building. I think in a nutshell, what we have learned through PEEP and which is now scalable is that actually through the work that we have done, data collection, measurement, capacity building, we are really in a position to put a price on the carbon saved by efficient buildings by the right regulatory measures. And this is extremely uh, important because only if we put a price tag and we can actually calculate what does it mean to really transform the whole building sector, we will be in a position even to mobilize more funding and more support in the international um, community. So this is really um, extremely um, um, important. Of course, as has been said previously, some of those efficiency measures, they can be funded by the private sector immediately because they have a high return in two or three years. Not necessarily then public institutions have to come into play. But in many instances, we really lack the groundwork and we are not yet there. We don't have the right markets in place or the regulatory frameworks that we need in order to scale up um, efficiency in the building sector so that they become more climate resilient and climate climate friendly. Remy has outlined the challenge, how huge it is, what has to happen every day, every week, every month. But only I think um, PEEP has now demonstrated is doable um, in a joint partnership between the public sector, financial institutions and the private sector. And I think now we are really ready uh, to jumpstart and get it to a scalable um, broad initiative that can deliver to many, many countries. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Yeah, the potential is huge. We saw this morning that actually we continue off track. The Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction just released its annual report and it shows clearly that we are not there. We are from far from reducing uh, the energy intensity of our buildings, but there is hope because energy efficiency in buildings remain the second most mentioned policy in the nationally determined contributions, which is really a reason for optimism. And uh, now we will hear from the countries what are the national authorities doing in terms of reducing the energy intensity of their buildings. Indonesia and North Macedonia are two of the countries that will participate in PIPCOOL and we will hear uh, first from the representative from Macedonia, Dr. Kustiana, who will uh, introduce us to, uh, to the key measures that you, are, that you are implementing in Indonesia. Thank you, Mariana. So first of all, I would like to thank also for the invitation and also to congratulate for this new initiative uh, for the energy building uh, project. And I think I would like also uh, to propose later on how Indonesia also can contribute to the success of this initiative. 
I think all aware that uh, Irina report mentioned that uh, the greenhouse gas emission reduction at least 25% coming from the energy efficiency activities. So we have also in, in the office, we have Thank you. Very sorry. So I would like to update what actually is happening here in the country, in Indonesia, in particular for energy efficiency. It's not really in particular on building. We have the target uh, in particular for the energy efficiency. We have the target of final energy intensity reduction of 1% per year. Well, this number is quite challenging and for us. Even though it's, it's only 1%, and, and I think we, we are on the track to reach this target. And in total, the final energy consumption reduction in 2025 is going to be reduced set by 70, 17% compared to the business as usual. And we are just half to, to reach this target. So this is actually uh, start, has been started in 2014. So we put the target and we still have something uh, eight year to go. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm coming from the ministry. So actually, my task is in preparing the regulation. So what actually has been prepared by by Indonesia in terms of the building sector regulation? We have the law on this. We have the law. Uh, in relation, not, not not in particular in terms of the energy efficiency, but we have law on building. And then... Thank you. And then in very specific, we have also green building code. This is uh, regulated through the uh, ministerial regulation. It is already in, in implementation, actually, it's just one year ago. So... It shows that since we realized that the energy efficiency is a very important, very strategic, and also to, to reach our commitment of the NDC on this. So in terms of the national standard, because I believe that having the standard is also uh, one, uh, not really uh, simple, but I think the easiest way also in preparing standard and how to, to reach the uh, performance minimum standard in terms of the energy utilization. We have the standards in 2020 on the lighting system. We have also the standard for energy conservation in building and flow. So, so lighting and also air conditioning. So I think all uh, the main energy uh, consumption in the building coming from uh, lighting, building, and also for the for the uh, air conditioning has been standardized in the country. So in total, we are also joining to to. To, to use the ISO 50001 on the energy management system. It has been in, in place in implementation in the country since 2018. The other one is for the human resources. And uh, we have the standard on energy manager for all, I think, for all uh, sectors, not only for building, but also for industry and also for the uh, yeah, industry and building. The other one is also the standard, competency standard for the energy auditor. I have this kind of the uh, certificate actually since 2000, uh, 2006. So those are actually uh, regulation already in place in us. We have in particular also the government regulation in energy efficiency. So it's cover all the not really mandatory, but the, for, for those uh, sector, industry, transportation, and also building has to report the implementation of the energy efficiency every year. But now I think it's getting simple. We have the application on this, so we can share how the result, and, and also we can uh, prepare the most suitable program for each sector, or for each subsector.
what all uh, has been done or, or in the strategies within the Ministry of Energy and Resources. The first is the energy saving standardization and labeling. We have uh, lighting, air conditioner, refrigerator, and other household uh, appliances have been in this uh, implementation for labeling program. Yeah. The other one is so uh, we uh, we also apply the energy saving technology, smart metering, for example, smart building, and also try to to introduce the use of the uh, the the electric stove in the house in the household. We, we are importing uh, seven million metric ton of the LPG. So we are trying to substitute this using much more efficient in terms of the energy utilization. The application of energy management, I said already the ISO 50001, uh, and also the MD conservation business development. This is the one that I would like to propose to you, Mariana. How then uh, the, it has to go in the commercial implementation, because I believe, as also mentioned earlier, that the energy efficiency is also the investment. They have very good return on this. So we like to propose also a whole then to encourage the role of ESCO. We have also in the country, I mean, that kind of implementation. I would try also to, to work together with the uh, financial institution, for example. Uh, and uh, this year, at least in the last year, actually, uh, we are revising the our government regulation in order how to fit this kind of the business. Yeah. This business works uh, for B2B, but it doesn't work when it goes to the government building. Because in government uh, funding mechanism, it has to be finished every year. So we cannot uh, continue this kind of the contract within the ESCO. It is probably that will be necessary to have four or five years project to, to have the good return for both. So we are trying to revise this kind of regulation. So I believe that later on, uh, the implementation of energy efficiency, it will be uh, business to business. It will be commercial implementation. It will be uh, with the motivation that how to, to get this uh, saving in terms of the cost. It's not, it's not only to get the uh, reduction of the energy. So I think this that I could share with you, Mariana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dalan. And that was a nice photography of where Indonesia stands. And uh, we have here two representatives of countries which are very different in, in terms of uh, a built environment uh, and, and in terms of energy needs, but also exposure to risks. And uh, this is also the other side of the coin. We often talked about mitigation and buildings have a huge potential, but buildings are where we live and where we must be protected as Sarah reminded us. I would like to hear Theodora from the North Macedonian experiences. Where are the priorities and where are the needs when it comes to greening the built environment? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, being part of this important launching of the program. I'm really happy that uh, my country, Republic of North Macedonia, is a partner of the program. And I would like to give uh, just one aspect more, that uh, we are facing challenges since we are candidate country for full membership, for full membership into the EU. We are facing challenges in terms of transposition of European legislation into our legal system from one side, and also uh, commitments which are arising from international uh, commitments like Paris Agreement, etc. But from the other side, all actions need to be also uh, accepted bottom-up by, by, by the citizen per se. That's why what we did in my country, um, we inserted international and EU obligation and assess it, it into our national circumstances and what does it mean? We have shown by numbers that these actions, policy and actions in energy efficiency are uh, so-called win-win or triple win measures, since that they're not just reducing GHG emissions, 
they also um, have negative cost and they are producing so-called green jobs. When we made assessments in all our documents which are adopted by the government, uh, in our NDC, third national update report, in our long-term strategy, etc., we have identified several measures in this sector and we have assessed potential for reduction, cost for the implementation of those measures, as well as the potential for creation of green jobs. And I think that is the, the message which needs to be sent by the governments that this is not just a cost, it is a challenge for growth. It is also related with sustainable development, overall sustainable development, and it needs to be included in the overall development strategy and financing strategy and investment strategy of each country. And I think that we did it in my, in my country and we succeeded in um, mainstreaming this issue, uh, which is maybe more energy issue, but mainstreaming it in other policies, in climate policies, in development policies, in investment policies, uh, by showing, by example, that it can not be treated just as a cost, but also it needs to be treated as a, as a challenge and opportunity for growth. I will not go into details with numbers. I prepared uh, numbers. Uh, who is interested, you can visit our website, Klimatski Promeni MK. All documents are available there, adopted, and they clearly set our decarbonization roadmap, including policies and measures in energy efficiency sector. And all of them are assessed uh, in details and in depth. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very interesting and it gives you, it gives us a, a good overview. I haven't read the 200 plus pages of the funding proposal to the Green Climate Fund, but I could scan it. And I saw that the beauty of this project is that it really looks into the needs of the country. What are the specificities, right? And we're talking here about huge countries. We also have Argentina, Mexico, we have, uh, Nigeria, also, but also a small country like Djibouti, for example, or North Macedonia. There, there is no small country. But we all have big problems. And I would like to, because now starts the real work. Now the Green Climate Fund uh, has approved uh, this 200 plus uh, million uh, USD. And now the work between the implementing agencies, the PIB, and the countries start. So where would you say that the low-hanging fruits are in terms of, okay, what are the actionable uh, measures the, the, that could help us go faster and further in terms of energy efficiency in buildings? I would like to start with Indonesia. Thank you. So I said already the first, the first is for the ESCO. I think that will be our priority also. Uh, of course, they will be in combination with the government initiative on this. The other one is the uh, minimum performance energy standard. So it has to go also. We, we have some already. We have, I think we have five or six uh, appliances already uh, having the, the standard and has been also uh, been regulated for the implementation. But I think we have to add more on this. Then, that then we need some survey. We need some uh, discussion. We need to uh, 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 convince people, and also we need to make sure that th this is also a product that uh, can be produced uh, nationally. It's not only basically probably a better uh, uh, performance will be imported, but no, we are combining this aspect, yeah. The, also the combination of local content on this. So I would like to propose at least that two things. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And now from the Macedonia, North Macedonian perspective, where could be the sectors and the actions that could be fruitful the faster? Uh, as I already explained, <clears throat> Into our national adopted documents, we have explored 63 measures, including um, policies and measures in energy sector. 
and we have explored uh, retrofitting, uh, passive houses, uh, awareness, and it's in it's important maybe to underline that uh, creating on energy efficiency info hubs, for example, is a very win-win measure because it has a very large negative cost for implementation and very high potential for reduction of GHG emission. So uh, my advice would be to follow all those measures which are already analyzed and to create um, to create appropriate governance and coordination structure in order to coordinate all international and bilateral support in this sector, because there are a lot of them in the energy efficiency uh, sector. But the, the, the beauty of the story is that we have scientific data which proves and uh, if we are wise, and I think that we are wise as a government, we will and we will have to follow all those as assessments which are already adopted at governmental level based on science. <laughs> it is not a matter of reinventing the wheel, but uh, that being more effective on what we do and what we know we must do. And um, before we go back to the German cooperation, I would like to give the opportunity just one word from uh, Mathilde Bourdon. Um, she's in charge of climate, but also nature. And uh, we can't uh, say it enough. The built environment is part of the nature we all live. And we cannot be built against nature. And I would like, uh, Mathilde, to have your, your vision of what is next in terms of uh, what, what is opening up now, this cooperation with the Green, Green Climate Fund and with the beneficiary countries for the AFD. Thank you. And there was nothing planned, but I, I'm, I'm always pleased to to step up for the, this program for energy efficiency in building that I've seen it in its early years. So uh, very, very pleased to be here for this uh, moment. No, I mean, uh, difficult to answer like that, uh, this, uh, this, this question. What I, if I had one message today is that uh, partnership and focus shows that you can do great things. We've done great things, Vera. Huh? <laughs> I think. <laughs> and uh, really, it's a, it's, a, it's a success. We are so proud and pleased to open up the PIB in so many new countries together, leaking the... Um, it's tough job for everybody. I mean, we, we heard a lot of people, it's technical, it's specific. You have to work on public policies, on regulation. You have to bring in the private sector with you to train, to show it's doable. You have to find the, I, I really like what is on, what are on those walls to, to have, to use new building materials. You have to change all the mindset about buildings. We are, we are working jointly on this and we show that we can do in, a, in, in 11 more countries. We also have a, a new funding for people in the Mediterranean region in seven new countries this year as well. So this program, which started with 8 million from France and Germany, is now a 300 million euro program, adding up to 3 billion of investment. This is a real success. So that's very good news. I'm very proud. Well, congratulations, Mathilde, because we know how much work uh, personally also you put in, in making this uh, funding proposal a success. And I would like um, just one message uh, from Ingrid before we go. Ingrid, you mentioned the multidimensional crisis. We are unfortunately now in the middle of in Europe. We are feeling it. Uh, the cost of energy, unfortunately, is reminding us how we must take care of our buildings being as efficient as possible. So we are all running in trying to, to make savings where we can. One message from, from the GIZ in terms of how this is not just a, an agenda for the global south or for, for countries, uh, uh, middle income countries that, um, that have a lot to do in infrastructure, but it is a global agenda and we should all be pushing together. One last message. Before we wrap up, yes, um, as you said at the beginning of this wonderful uh, launch event, is uh, the building sector is the sleeping giant when it comes to climate protection and dealing with the impact of, of climate change. 
when the good news is actually, although we are living very, very difficult times, that these difficult times, I think, have really now let felt people, communities and governments, how important it is to deal with energy efficiency issues. And that it's to the self-interest of all these stakeholders really to change course. And the beauty of this launch event actually is when I see the long list that I've just seen for Macedonia, and then, I mean, your, your, um, your story about what you, you want to do, you showcase actually, you are the ones that, that showcase that this is doable. It's not an agenda that has been, so to say, elaborated in institutions, uh, in, in some capitals, but it's really an agenda where we simply give you a hand. We provide you some advice. We provide you some analytical tools. But you are the ones that pick up those instruments and say, look, I now screen what I have to do and I decide what comes first and what is my priority list. And PEEP exactly leads governments into this direction. And therefore, I think I hope that we can pursue this course more forcefully with the additional funding from the GCF because you actually have to drive the agenda and we can give you like, the type of additional support, additional leverage that is needed that you can actually implement quicker, faster, and at scale. So many thanks to especially our partner countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ingrid. And before we go uh, into a celebration mo mo moment, I would like to give the floor to uh, Vera uh, Rodenhoff, who's in charge of implementation, international cooperation at the, the GAZ. And I would like, Vera, to invite you to give to give the floor uh, to, sorry, to, to, to wrap up this and let us know a little bit more about the details of uh, people who are. Sure, of course. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me? Okay, so I actually work at the, uh, in, for Ger the German government in the That's ministry right. Uh, of economic affairs and climate action, but we work together very well with the GIZ, and uh, I, I think this is one of the projects that showcases that. Yeah, and um, so many important things have said here together. We've all alluded to the crisis, energy, climate. Um, there's also a health crisis, and there's also a housing crisis, and uh, buildings, uh, and we've heard that already. Bring these provide one of the solutions and one of the things that hasn't been stressed enough but I think it's self-evident is also that building energy efficiency in buildings and we see this in Europe right now uh, especially but of course all over the globe uh, they help make us energy independent so it's also a question of energy security if, if we don't need to spend fossil fuels import fossil fuels to either cool or heat buildings we are more energy independent, and this is why it is so important. So um, I think we've heard very much about PEEP. I think what also we can learn today is that um, it's, it's a good example of collaboration, and we're very proud to have uh, kickstarted this project together with France. And I really acknowledge all the work that France put into that. Also in Paris, um, the Global Coalition Global Alliance for Building and Construction was launched. And so PEEP is, a, and this hasn't been mentioned before, is kind of a, a baby initiative um, that supports the Global ABC, which is also an endeavor we support. And uh, another uh, very important uh, initiative that will be, is in the middle of the launch, is also uh, the Building Breakthrough, uh, where France will also champion it as, as a co-chair. So um, we really have to get more attention to buildings. Um, and we've heard the numbers, but somehow it has to get across. And um, I do not really want to make more words. I think uh, it's good to go outside and enjoy um, the reception. And I've been very glad that uh, I was able and still am uh, the, the chair of the policy orientation committee, uh, where also we worked very well when you matured were the steering committee uh, chair. And um, we are really, really proud that um, we launched this project, that this project is receiving uh, uh, now a, a grant from the GCF to um, uh, leverage even more money for the building sector. And um, it's important to see 
projects can be scaled if they are good ones. And it's also an example, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Look for good initiatives and projects and scale them. And then uh, spread the word. Collaboration works and innovation works and scaling works. So I hope to talk to you outside at the reception. Thank you. Thank you very much and my apologies, Vera. I spent my days with GIZ and AFD colleagues and uh, for me this is my, my, my short family but we are in an extended family here with, with new family members joining us. Thank you very much, Vera. Thank you very much, uh, Dada. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Theodora, and of course, uh, thank you, Mathilde and Remy and Sara, who had to leave a bit earlier today. Thank you to everyone here in the room. Thank you to the colleagues. I don't know if we can show the colleagues who are in the Zoom and who are in Paris, in Germany. Um, they are watching us, and uh, we send from here greetings and a big thank you for making big cool possible with uh, with that funding proposal that was successful thank you every, every thank you very much to everyone and let's enjoy our celebration moment thank you